If you think that exerting really strong battlefield control, I'm talking completely locking down and immobilizing a target on the battlefield in D&D, while also doing some pretty decent damage to them at the same time, sounds like a lot of fun. Or if you just like Bladesinger builds, then you're gonna wanna watch this video. Welcome to D4. Bonjour, mes amis, bienvenue, and welcome. So here at D4, each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for our favorite TTRPGs. We theorycraft about them, we crunch numbers about them, not so that I can tell you the right way or the best way to play a certain character, but to explore one potential way to build a character that you're thinking about playing in-game. So. If you enjoy creating characters for your favorite role-playing games almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas on how to build something that you're thinking about playing, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and I'm so glad you're here. So thanks for being here. And by here, in case you haven't noticed, I mean not where I usually record. As I mentioned last time, I am kind of out on vacation, the workcation, I guess, with my family. I'm going down to just every other week for video production, just like for this video, and it'll be a couple of weeks to the next one, and then a couple of weeks and I'll get back on schedule. Yeah, it looks different, it feels different, it sounds different. I know it's pretty echoey in here, so thanks for bearing with me as I adjust to my new surroundings and try to take the show on the road, as it were. I appreciate being able to kind of record from anywhere as long as I've got my laptop and an internet connection, and big thanks to you guys for making that possible watching, liking, subscribing, commenting, and ringing the notifications bell are great ways to support me and support the channel and make it so that I can do this full time. And without you guys, I couldn't do it. And especially not without my channel members. Huge shout out and thanks to you. If you'd be interested in lending some additional support to me and to what I'm trying to do here, I'd appreciate it if you'd join as a member. There's a button down there and for a dollar or two a month, you can lend me some really fantastic and helpful support and also get access to the cheat sheet slash library of write-ups that I do for each one of these builds so you can recreate the character yourself in-game if you want to a lot more easily. Okay, ever since I did my first Bladesinger build so very long ago, I've been getting comments that talk about how amazing it would be to couple Bladesinger with three levels of Artificer so I could use intelligence for attacking and thus not have to worry about my dexterity. My response to that suggestion almost always tends to be, yeah, that'd be nice, but three levels is just too high of an investment to make for my blade singer. I can't imagine slowing down my progression that much. It's just not worth it. That said, I have found exceptions to that rule. Even doing three levels of Artificer uh, when I did my Bladesinger tank video a while ago. And today I want to explore another exception, and it is this. It might be worth taking three levels of Artificer if your spell hit chance is as important as your weapon hit chance. Okay, fine. So when is your spell hit chance as important on a blade singer as your weapon hit chance? I think it's when you're trying to build a character who is just as concerned about controlling their enemies as they are about damaging them. I mean, okay, let's be honest. A lot of people out there, maybe most in fact, argue that the blade singer is best thought of as a wizard first and foremost who has some nice defensive boosts and can maybe make some weapon attacks once in a while, right? Longtime viewers of my channel know how I feel about that theory. I don't really think I need to rehash it here, but feel free to go here for a full soapbox rant. I think the main reason, feel free to correct me if you think I'm wrong, that people argue for that theory is because the best and most powerful wizard spells tend to be control focused, right? Things like hypnotic pattern, fear, wall of force. These spells can potentially do a lot more to turn the tide of a battle in your party's favor than doing a little more damage can because they can essentially remove one or more enemies from the fight until you're ready to deal with them, right? So you should not, for example, use your concentration to bolster your damage with things like Shadow Blade or Spirit Shroud or Haste, because doing a little, or even a lot, more damage as a blade singer isn't doing as much for your team as controlling the enemy would. That's how that argument goes anyway. But 
What if there were a middle ground? What if you could do really decent single target damage per round as a Bladesinger while totally locking down an enemy? That's the thing I'm gonna try to build around today. Our damage as a result might be a little less than some other characters that I've built, but they will have really, really strong control over at least one target in combat, potentially eliminating them from doing anything effective on their turn so long as they're a melee enemy at least. And while it might bring less hard control than a wizard that was focused on control spells all the time, I think it will give us a really nice middle ground where we can enjoy all the fun and flashiness of being a live, blade singing, hard hitting melee combatant who fuses sword and spell in the best gishy way, but also the solid tactical advantage of almost totally removing an enemy from the fight by rooting them completely in place. All right, are you ready? I proudly present D&D build number 140, the freeze singer, the slow singer, the blade freezer, the blade catcher, the snare singer, <laughs> the battle singer and the blade smith. Sound really cool, but I think a more apropos title and one that's perhaps a little more poetic as well, was suggested by my good friend Dallin, the singer of ice and artifice. Huge thanks to my good friend Randall Hampton for the fantastic artwork that he came up with for this build. He does this every week. He's so good. You guys know this if you want to follow him on social media to check out the other things that he does or to potentially try and commission him to create some art for your character or even your entire party, potentially. I will put links in the video description on how to do so as always. Also, before we jump into the build, I'm super excited to tell you guys about the sponsor today. It's Spectre Creations and their newly launched on Kickstarter 5e compatible book, Kalia's Chronicle of Runes. Guys, this book is going to be awesome, and here's why. It gives you a balanced, fun, and even aesthetically pleasing way to empower your favorite weapons, armor, and other gear in-game so that they not only become more powerful, but increase in power potentially with you, essentially leveling up as your character levels up. You know, I've always wished that 5e had ways to do this inherently, since so often I make my characters weapons especially, but sometimes even armor and things, kind of important to my backstory and or to my character arc. I get fairly attached to my weapons, even when I'm not playing a Hexblade. It always feels bad to just toss them aside the first time a more powerful magic item comes along. Well, with Kalia's Chronicle of Runes, you won't have to. This book is going to be over 300 pages long and will contain a fully fleshed out rune system with hundreds of runes and gorgeous artwork to boot. Check it out. As for the runes themselves, think of them like tattoos, but for your weapons. There's a huge variety of them that you can attach to your gear to increase its power. And this is my favorite part. They're actually written in the various languages of D&D 5e, with each language having its own unique art, script, and even fonts that you can actually download and then type with. Perfect for making immersive character sheets, maps, handouts for your table. Check it out. This is D4 D&D Deep Dive, written in Deep Speech, Giant, Dwarvish, and Orcish. So cool. In addition to the rune system, there's so much more to this book. They've included 12, yes, 12 new subclasses, dozens of races and subraces, plus additional spells, feats, and warlock invocations. There are more than 80 new monsters. All of these options are designed around a specific language in the book, like Sylvan for the seasonal sorcerer, for example, or Giant for the half-giant race. You guys, this book is going to be amazing, and you should absolutely go back the project. It's set to launch the day after I record this, so it's already launched, right? I don't know how the Kickstarter is doing yet, but at the time of this video release, there's only a couple weeks left to back the project. Go back it. You won't regret it. Here's the link that I'll ask you to use, spectrecreations.com d4. That's how they will know that I sent you, so I'd appreciate it if you'd use that. I'll put that link in the video description, as always, of course. All right, huge thanks to Spectre Creations. Can't wait to see the finished product here, and let's jump into the build. All right. At level one, for our starting class, yes, we're gonna start off wizard. I was tempted to start artificer here. You might want to. Beelining to the ability to make attacks with our intelligence feels like a good move if that's kind of a big aspect of what we're going for here. That said, we're still going to have a passable dexterity that will help us get through those first few levels. 
And in the end, getting to Bladesinger's extra attack will do a lot more for us by our first damage report than having a slightly higher plus to hit and damage would if we went Artificer 3 first, focusing on intelligence like we are, right? Besides, extra attack and third level wizard spells are going to be key to our snare tactics. So it feels like the right move to beeline to wizard 6 for this concept. For sure. So yes, when we first meet our champion, they are a student of the arcane. You might have a penchant for tinkering though, using your own knowledge of the arcane to try and infuse your clockwork creations with life, or enchanting objects you make or use with a bit of the magic that you're learning to wield. Maybe that practice is even frowned upon by your teachers, but you keep trying and failing at this point to infuse the world with arcane artifice. You'll figure it out one day. As for our race, there is a feat that we absolutely have to have to make this build work the way I want it to, and it just so happens that it's a half feat that will bump an ability score that we really want, so I think I'm going variant human here. Doing so gives us a plus one in two ability scores, and will actually let us start with a 16 in our three most important abilities, which will be perfect. As for the free feat that I want to take here, if you said slasher, you win. All right, this is step one to becoming a snare specialist. The slasher feat will give us a plus one to our dexterity, and then tells us that once per turn, if we hit with an attack that does slashing damage, we can reduce the enemy's move speed by 10 feet until the start of our next turn. Also, if we get a critical hit, they have disadvantage on all of their attacks until our next turn as well. Very good, very important. As for our starting ability scores, I'm assuming that we're going the point by method as always, and recommend taking a 15 in intelligence, plus one from Varian Human there, a 15 in Dexterity, plus one from Slasher, like we've said there, and a 15 Constitution, plus one from Variant Human there. So yes, that's a 16 in all three ability scores that we really need. Now, some of you may be asking, wait, I thought we were going Artificer so that we could be sad, right? Single ability score dependent, just focusing on intelligence. Why bother with a 16 Dexterity? Well, the reality is that even though intelligence will be a lot more important for us on this build, yes, we do still really want a good dexterity. First of all, like I've said, it will greatly improve our weapon attacks until we get to Artificer 3, which is kind of a long ways off at this point. Second, it will still benefit our armor class, even when we're blade singing. And third, having a nice deck save and initiative bonus, etc will always be helpful on any character. Yes, I know you could go turtle and then have a decent armor class without having to worry about dexterity, but we still want dexterity for the other reasons that I've listed. As for our equipment, I'm going to suggest that we go the gold buy route as I often do because we need some fairly unconventional wizard equipment. First up, we wanna buy studded leather, though we can't use it until next level. And then we want a weapon. Who knows what weapon we're gonna focus on here. Rapier? No. Scimitar? Uh -uh. If you said whip, you win. Well, that's right, the whip. I love using unconventional weapons, especially when they are absolutely the best choice for the build, regardless of whether or not their damage is a little low, like it is in the case of the whip. Now, I've only built around the whip one other time on this channel when I did the whipper will a long time ago. And by the way, if you want to see Randall Hampton drawing live in action, that's a great one to watch too, by the way, because he just draws as I go over what the build is gonna be. It's pretty cool. Anyway, if I'm being honest, the build that we're doing today might make even better use of the whip than that one did. It's definitely more important to the build anyway. All right, the whip has some incredibly important traits for us. First of all, it does slashing damage. We need that, right? We got the slasher feet. Secondly, it's a finesse weapon, so we can use our dexterity for our plus to hit and damage. Third, it has reach. And I think it's the only finesse weapon that has reach actually in the game. Now, all of these things make it absolutely ideal for what we are going to be doing here, but I'll explain more as we go on. As a wizard one then, we get arcane recovery. This lets us recover spent spell slots once per day after a short rest equal to half our wizard level rounded up and never more than a fifth level spell slot. So just first level spell slots for now, of course, more spell slots, always good. And then we get wizard spells, of course. I would be sure to grab the usuals here. Shield and absorb elements for some nice defensive benefits. Mage armor for a possible 13 armor class instead of studded leathers 12 
it can be painful to give up a spell slot for mage armor in my experience that you could have maybe used for shield it's only a plus one to ac sometimes that'll be all the difference you need sometimes it won't help and you'll wish you had a spell slot instead right but you might prefer to go that route and if so that's fine of course you're gonna want silvery barbs because it's amazing and i definitely take find familiar for utility purposes but also to potentially get advantage on your first attack on a turn if you have your familiar take the help action right which i will assume that we're going to be doing on this build when i'm crunching the numbers as for cantrips we're going to want booming blade or green flame blade or maybe both this is going to be a good use of our action starting next level anyway better than taking the attack action since it will do a little extra extra damage to our target after fifth level anyways and with booming blade help ensure that the enemy stays in place since if they move they're going to take thunder damage for doing so and that's kind of the whole point of this build right is to try and root an enemy in place but the other cantrip that we've got to make sure and grab for this build is ray of frost this is part two of our snare specialist combo ray of frost has us make a ranged spell attack and if we hit we do a d8 of damage that scales like all cantrips do but then yes it reduces the enemy's move speed by by 10 feet. All right, now we're getting somewhere, or keeping them from getting somewhere, I guess. At level two, wizards get their subclass, their arcane tradition, and yes, we're taking, as I've said, my favorite subclass in all of D&D 5e, mechanically and practically at least, blade singing. As a blade singer, we get two very important features. First of all, training in Warren's song gives us light armor proficiency so we can put on that studded leather we've been carrying around, and proficiency in one type of one-handed weapon of our choice, doesn't matter, it can be simple or martial. We, of course, will take the whip, so now we can start going Indiana Jones on our enemies. The other important feature we get here, of course, is blade song. With a bonus action, we can now start our blade song, or maybe we should call it our whip song. Anyway, so long as we're not wearing heavy armor or a shield, it lasts for one minute and it gives us some fantastic benefits. We get an AC increase equal to our intelligence, so now with studded leather, a 16 intelligence, and a 16 dexterity, we'd have a very respectable 18 AC. 19 if we were using mage armor. We also get to add that intelligence modifier to our concentration checks, which is especially great since we don't have constitution saving throw proficiency. Another reason, by the way, to consider starting off as an artificer. We get advantage on acrobatics checks, which could be handy to avoid being grappled, among other things. And then finally, we get a 10 foot walking speed increase. Very, very nice. At level three, we get second level spells. And there's nothing I would plan on using here to improve our sustained DPR necessarily, but web is a fantastic root them in place control spell. So I imagine that would be my go-to for concentration here, potentially restraining enemies, which is wonderful. Other than that, I'd grab the usuals. Hold person to potentially paralyze a humanoid. Misty step for some on-demand teleporting. Mirror image to create illusory duplicates of yourself that your enemy might attack instead of you. That's especially handy when you're going into melee, right? Vortex warp to move friends or potentially enemies around the battlefield. You're a wizard. The world is your oyster. Enjoy. At level four, we get our first ability score increase or feat, and I think we've got to increase our intelligence here. It benefits almost everything we do, and eventually it's really gonna benefit everything we do. For now, it means better spells, better AC, better concentration checks. It's a no-brainer. At level five, we get third level spells, and while there are, of course, so many wonderful choices, including fear, hypnotic pattern, haste, fireball, counterspell, and many more. There are two that I'm going to say we've got to have and that are paramount to our success as a snare specialist. First up, Spirit Shroud. Spirit Shroud is a favorite spell of mine. My friend the Kobold over at Pack Tactics thinks it's kind of a trap and I kind of disagree. I mean, of course it depends on the situation, how long the combat's going to last, how many attacks you get, etc. But actually, you know what? I take it back. For this build, it is a trap. And that's totally the reason that we're taking it, because yes, in addition to the extra d8 of damage that you do with this spell, on all of your attacks to enemies within 10 feet for one minute, and no, these don't just have to be weapon attacks, they can be spell attacks too, which is really nice. Spirit Shroud, very importantly, yes, slows all enemies who start their turn within 10 feet of you by, you guessed it, 10 feet. It is the perfect trap to complement our snaring selves. So. For those counting, you'll notice that we now have three ways to potentially slow our enemies by 10 feet. Slashing with our whip, 
Ray of Frost, and now Spirit Shroud. Now, the vast majority of enemies in D&D 5e have 30 feet of move speed or less. So for those enemies, we will shortly be able to reduce their move speed to zero every round while staying safely just out of their reach. So awesome. Of course, there are a lot of enemies who have 35 or 40 feet of move speed too. What do we do about those guys, huh? Easy. The slow spell, which is the other third level spell that is a must have for us. Slow is probably my favorite debuff in the game. It does so many wonderful things. Reduces enemy AC and deck saves by two, prevents them from using reactions, forces them to choose between taking either an action or a bonus action on their turn, not both, might prevent them from getting a spell off on their turn, and best of all for us, reduces their move speed by half. So now, if we're dealing with a 40 foot move speed enemy, well, we can hit them and up to five of their friends with slow. And let's be honest, though concentrating on this as opposed to Spirit Shroud would reduce our own damage per round, it will probably do a lot more to help our entire party. So we should arguably be using this every fight, regardless of what the enemy's move speed is, right? But if we used it on an enemy with 40 feet of move speed, then it would put them at 20. And then we just need to hit them with a whip attack and a ray of frost attack to bring their move speed to zero. And fortunately for us, that's exactly what we would be able to do at the very next level because when we hit level six as a blade singer, that means we get extra attack. And not just any run of the mill extra attack, but the best extra attack of all time because we get to replace, if we want to, one of our weapon attacks with a cantrip. And we very much want to, don't we? All right, at level six, it's time for our first damage report. And you've probably already got this figured out, but just in case, let's discuss what tactics look like for us here. On round one, we're probably going blade song and then either casting slow with our action or making a whip attack and a ray of frost attack, right? I assume by the way that our familiar is giving us advantage on our ray of frost attack here since it's actually going to hit a little harder than our whip. It's scaled up to a 2d8 at level five, right? If we're using Spirit Shroud, which I will assume since most enemies have 30 feet of move speed or less, and it's gonna make our damage numbers look better and I'm beholden to the spreadsheet, then we would cast Spirit Shroud on round two since it takes a bonus action to cast and then continue making our speed reducing whip and ray of frost attacks, right? But this time, of course, reducing our enemy's move speed by 30 if we hit with the whip, the ray of frost, and stay within 10 feet of them, which we can do while remaining perfectly safe thanks to the reach of our whip. Obviously then, we're going to want to be targeting melee enemies here. Thankfully, the vast majority of enemies in D&D are also melee enemies. And when we do this, it's going to be so fantastically wonderful to just watch them stand there, frustrated, dumbfounded, unable to do anything useful while we stand just outside of their reach and whip, freeze, and snare them at our leisure over and over and over again until they're dead. And thus, against enemies with a 10 armor class, we would on average here do 24 damage per round. And against enemies with a 15 AC, it would be 20 DPR. And sure, that is the lowest damage of any sustained DPR build that I've ever done to date. Check the video description to see those comparisons to the different builds, right? I graph it, I spreadsheet it. But it's only the worst by a teeny bit. And these builds were all built for sustained DPR. And you know what it's not worse than? Builds that I've done that are focused exclusively on support or control. I mean, the Control Freak is probably the most powerful build I've done to date. I'm still gonna argue that. And it did zero damage. So there always seems to be like this ebb and flow to control and damage in character creation with D&D 5e. This build has the potential to basically remove an enemy from the fight completely and do damage to them while remaining safe. And sure, if you wanted to, you could switch tactics and throw out fear or hypnotic pattern and control more, but do even less damage. Or, for that matter, you could swap to a shadow blade and give up your control for superior damage. That's the beauty of being a blade singer. You've got options. And yes, our damage actually will be scaling pretty nicely throughout the life of this build. Because at level seven, it's time to start on those artificer levels. Now that we've secured extra attack and those important third level spells. So 
at this point in our character's career, I think they've finally succeeded in getting their clockwork creations to actually accept the endowment of the arcane they've been trying all this time to infuse them with. Perhaps someone showed you what you were doing wrong and helped you bridge the gap. Or maybe you had a vision or a simple epiphany while studying a forbidden tome of artifice. I'm not sure, but regardless, as an Artificer 1 here, we get first up Magical Tinkering, which lets us infuse a non-magical mundane item to make it emit a sound or a light or a message or even a smell. Some fun little utility here. And then we get Artificer Spells. Now, there's a lot of redundancy here with Wizard Spells that we already have access to, but I would be sure to grab a couple that we couldn't get before. Cure Wounds for some nice backup healing if our team needs it in a pinch, and Fairy Fire to potentially debuff enemies in a 20-foot area to cause all attacks against them to be made with advantage at the cost of our concentration. I doubt I'd be using our concentration for this all that often, but it is a nice option to have if we're out of higher level spell slots, or we've got an enemy that might go invisible on us, etc., because Fairy Fire prevents enemies from benefiting from invisibility. So, a nice option to have. Don't forget as well that because of how multi-classing works with Artificer specifically, where you take half your Artificer levels rounded up, unlike other half-casters, rangers, and paladins who round down, right? We now have fourth level spell slots. At level eight, we would be an Artificer 2, and that means we get Infuse Item, which is my favorite Artificer feature. It lets us enhance some non-magical items and make them magical. We can learn four infusions from a fantastic list of options, but only can use two of them at a time. No one item can hold more than one infusion, and we can't use a single infusion on more than one item. For now, as much as I'd love to have Enhanced Defense and Mind Sharpener, I'll assume we're using Enhanced Weapon and Enhanced Arcane Focus to give both our Whip Attacks and our Ray of Frost a plus one each to hit and a plus one to damage for our weapons as well, right? Of course, you very well may have a Magical Whip by now, in which case, go ahead and take that Mind Sharpener to help you hold on to your concentration even better, or Enhanced Defense if you don't have Magical Armor by now too to give yourself a nice bump to AC. But at level nine, we would be an Artificer 3, and that's sort of the promised land for us because we get the right tool for the job. Wait a sec, that's what we get at Artificer 3 that we've been waiting all this time for? <laughs> no, of course not. This is a ribbon feature. It lets us magically create some tools if we need them. What we're excited about is our Artificer Specialist, our Artificer subclass, because we're taking, yes, Battlesmith. Battlesmith gives us a slew of wonderful features. First of all, we get additional spells. We already had shield, but heroism is a nice little buff that grants temporary hit points to an ally or to us at the beginning of every turn. Unfortunately, it requires our concentration, so we're probably not using this very often. More importantly, we get battle ready, which is the thing that is going to let us make our whip attacks with our intelligence modifier instead of our dexterity modifier, so long as the whip is magical. And so long as we at least have our enhanced weapon infusion on our whip, it will be. What's more, we get our Steel Defender here. This is a happy little pet that lets us weaponize our bonus action. Up until now, we've been unable to do so, unfortunately, because while the whip is a finesse weapon, it is not a light weapon. So we haven't been able to take advantage of two weapon fighting, for example. No problem, we've still been able to do all the snaring we need with just our action. Plus our bonus actions have been required for blade singing and for spirit, Trouting. <laughs> but now, well, once we've done both of those things, at least we can get a little more damage out of our Steel Defender. We create this little companion at the end of a long rest, and like most pets in 5e these days, it just takes the dodge action unless we use our bonus action to have it do something else. That something else will most often be a force-empowered rend attack, which uses our spell attack modifier to hit, and remember, our arcane focus increases our spell attack by one, so yes, this should apply to the Steel Defender as well, which is nice. Though the attack only does a d8 of damage plus our proficiency bonus, it's not a lot, and it might not even be advisable to use this on our primary ensnared target, right? Since the point has been to keep that enemy rooted in place and unable to attack anything, and if we put our Steel Defender in melee range of them, they don't have reach, well, 
they'd probably be getting attacked by the enemy. But no reason why you couldn't sick this steel defender on a different enemy. They also have the nice deflect attack reaction that I tried to make good use of in my battlesmith tank, where the steel defender was the tank for my party. I don't know if I have enough cards left to link to it there, but anyway, that was a really fun build. This lets the steel defender impose disadvantage on an enemy if the enemy attacks anyone but the steel defender, right? So they get a little soft taunt, but it only works on a single attack and it requires the steel defender's reaction still it's super useful so it's a good option to have to keep your allies or heck even yourself sometimes a little bit safer all right at level nine it's time for our next damage report since last check quite a bit has changed for us in that we're now using our intelligence modifier for both our weapon and our spell attacks we've bumped our hit and damage by one thanks to our infusions and we've picked up some damage with our bonus action thanks to our steel defender and so, at this level, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would do 35 damage per round on average now, and against an enemy with a 16 armor class, it would be a 29. And that's a very significant 50% increase to damage, give or take. Though, of course, it's still nothing to write home about. It kind of keeps us near the bottom of tier 4 compared to other sustained damage builds that I've done to date, but it's not quite the bottom of the barrel anymore. And again, it's potentially rendering at least one enemy totally impotent in the process. So although the power of the build doesn't really show up in the spreadsheet so much, make no mistake, we are doing a lot of good on the battlefield here. More importantly, we're having a ton of fun laughing at our useless enemies while we bob and weave and freeze and crack that whip. At level 10 though, with our ability to attack with intelligence secure, as well as a nice weaponized bonus action and some additional bumps via infusions, it's time to return to wizard. Meaning we would be a wizard seven here and that gives us fourth level spells. And while banishment and polymorph and dimension door and greater invisibility and more are all great and fun and powerful, there's nothing I'm doing here to boost my DPR or improve my snaring, so go ahead and PYF. Pick your favorites. Don't forget that thanks to multi-classing, again, we've got fifth level spell slots here at this level, meaning we could, if we wanted, upcast Spirit Shroud to do 2d8 damage per hit, right? Because it only scales every two levels that you upcast it. At level 11, we would be a Wizard 8, and that means another ability score increase or feat, and yes, especially now that we've got three levels of Battlesmith, we kind of just have to bump intelligence here, don't we? Taking it to 20, so fantastic. And of course, at character level 11, all cantrips scale up, so our Ray of Frost now does 3d8 damage on a hit. Not too shabby. At level 12, we would be a wizard 9, and that means 5th level spells, and similar to 4th level spells, while animate objects and Bigby's hand, dominate person, hold monster, wall of force, synaptic static, and more are all amazing. There's nothing that I would plan on using round after round necessarily for this build. Of course, you want to have options, and yeah, most of the time, Wall of Force is going to do a better job of controlling your enemies than the route that we've gone, right? But again, your damage is going to be a lot lower if you do it, so you're just going to have to decide where you want to be on that damage versus control continuum, right? It's great to have lots of options. At level 13, we would be a wizard 10, and that means we get Song of Defense. This is a situationally pretty useful ability. It tells us that when we take damage, we can use our reaction and a spell slot to reduce the damage taken by five times the spell slot's level. Now, obviously, shield will be better than this most of the time since it lasts until our next turn, right? Not just against that one instance of damage or, you know, absorb elements if we're facing elemental damage to just cut the damage in half. But like I've said before, sometimes the enemy rolls so high that shield isn't going to affect their attack, right? Or you take spell damage, but not of an elemental type and you're getting close to going unconscious or maybe you got crit, right? So yeah. Yeah, this is a nice break the glass in case of emergency option to have when we really need it. All right, at level 13, it's time for our next damage report. And compared to last check, we can now upcast Spirit Shroud at the fifth level, letting us do 2d8 damage on our whip and ray of frost attacks. We've capped our intelligence at 20, and we've gained another 1d8 to our Ray of Frost. Of course, we've also gained a ton of potential increased utility, control, and survivability thanks to our better spells and other Bladesinger features. 
And at this level then, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would on average do 51 damage per round. And versus a 17 AC, it would be a 44 DPR. And again, that's a pretty nice bump versus last time, putting us still in tier four, but kind of closer to the middle of tier four compared to other sustained DPR builds that I've done to date at this level. And this is one thing that I really appreciate about this build, actually, the way that it scales damage-wise pretty consistently throughout their career, while, of course, still getting to be mostly a wizard and everything that entails in D&D 5e, right? All right, at level 14, we would be a wizard 11, and that means sixth level spells. And just like the last two times, I mean, you really should take mass suggestion for some combat encounter ending time to go home now everybody power but there's nothing here that i'm going to take to improve our damage and our snaring although investiture of ice is potentially interesting for this build it causes the ground around you to be difficult to rain unfortunately it affects friends and foes alike and also lets you as an action shoot out like a mini cone of cold to do some damage but also have the move speed of anyone hit by it. Ultimately, it would be less damage to a single target than what we're currently doing, but if you need to, for some reason, consistently slow a group of enemies and do some damage to them, I don't know, it feels thematically appropriate anyway, but probably subpar most of the time compared to other options for concentration. If you need slow, use the slow spell, right? If you need AoE damage every turn, Dragon's Breath would actually be a lot better if you're using a sixth level spell slot. If you need a little bit of both, I guess, sure, Investiture of Ice. We do get seventh level spell slots here as well with multi-classing, meaning we could be upcasting Spirit Shroud to do 3d8 extra damage per hit, which is really wonderful if expensive at a seventh level spell slot, right? At level 15, we are a wizard 12, and I think I'd probably bump dexterity here. There's definitely an argument for resilient constitution to let us gain proficiency in constitution saving throws and concentration checks, assuming that we didn't start with a level of artificer, right? But at this point, we've got to have a magic whip, right? Which means we're free to use one of our infusions for mind sharpener. And with that, plus blade song adding our intelligence to our concentration checks, I'm a lot less worried about holding on to concentration. I'd love, you know, I'd love to be able to take dual wielder here to let us dual wield whips and then use two weapon fighting and like for our bonus action start whipping instead of using our steel defender. Thanks to spirit shroud we would get a lot more damage from a second whip attack plus dual wielding whips, right? How cool would that be? Only problem is we need an empty hand to cast ray of frost every round unless we also get, yeah, warcaster. So that's a two feet investment to be able to dual wield whips here. <sighs> but you know what? Screw it. I'm gonna call an audible here. Dual wielding whips, people. I mean, if we do this, we're not gonna get Song of Victory by level 17, and I hate that, because Song of Victory is really good. But dual wielding whips! All right, we're not bumping dexterity. We're taking Warcaster here. It's gonna let us cast with our hands full, which means we can Ray of Frost, even when we get two whips going later. And of course, Warcaster gives us advantage on our concentration checks, that's nice, and lets us cast a spell as an opportunity attack if we really wanted to. But then at level 16, we would go Artificer 4, so that we could grab that ability score increaser feat that's just sitting right there, and then take Dual Wielder, letting us dual wield freaking whips like a bad A. <laughs> I can't say the bad word. Now, yes, we will start two weapon fighting with our bonus action, so I guess our faithful steel defender is relegated to just dodging and using their reaction to try and help keep our allies safe. That's still useful, don't feel bad. And then finally for us at level 17, we'd be a wizard 13, so we could get seventh level spells, right? Because that means we can get force cage because you have to get force cage. It's like an improved wall of force, and it doesn't even require our concentration, so we really take our control to an 11 here, and don't have to sacrifice any of our damage for it either. And don't forget that Ray of Frost does get its final increase here up to a 4d8 on a hit, which is nice. All right, so for our final damage report then, I've had to recalculate some numbers, but since last check, we've added a whip attack for a bonus action, and thanks to Spirit Shroud, which we can now upcast to 3d8 of damage per hit, that's a nice little damage increase for us. Admittedly, it's not a huge damage increase over what we would have gotten from Song of Victory, but an increase is an increase. 
and it's freaking cool. And assuming we're playing this character to level 18, right, we would be even better off now dual wielding. So it only delayed that Song of Victory by one level. Plus, yeah, picked up some additional benefits from Warcaster, right? And we've also seen, since last check, a Ray of Frost bump, and then picked up lots of great control and utility and defensive increases, again, thanks mostly to our better spells. And so, against enemies with a 10 armor class here, we would on average do 78 damage per round, and against enemies with an 18 AC, it would be 67 DPR. And again, that's about a 50% increase since last check, landing us now compared to other sustained DPR builds that I've done to date at this level, at like the top of tier four, maybe even bottom of tier three. So yeah, I continue to love the way this build scales, increasing in both damage and control, thanks to better spell options, the higher we go. All right, let's bring it on home with some final thoughts. The tier score for this build, if you take the damage that they do at all of the armor classes that we calculate for at each of the four damage reports and just average them all into one big number, we end up with a 37, and this lands us just kind of in the middle of tier four in the company, not too surprisingly, I guess, of some other control-focused builds like the Street Fighter, the Hammer Thrower, right? So we're in really good company here. All right, there are some things that I really love about this build, and there are some things that I don't love so much. The thing that bothers me the most is the lack of consistent advantage, actually. I thought about doing some Battle Master to try and get trip attack, but the problem is prone enemies only would give us advantage if we're within five feet of them, and the whole point here was to root the enemy in place and not give them anyone to attack, right? That said, if we could have knocked them prone and reduced their move speed to zero, well, now they wouldn't be able to stand, right? It takes half your move speed to stand up. If you have no move speed, you're stuck on the ground. And I really love the idea of just keeping them rooted and prone from a distance, right? But yeah, it was just a little too clunky with what we were trying to do with ranged and reach attacks. I also, in hindsight, wish I could have gotten to dual wielding whips a little quicker. Sure, we could have delayed capping our intelligence, but with a build that sacrificed so much so that we could attack with intelligence, delaying getting intelligence to 20 for really anything just felt off. All that said, man, I really love making great use of a whip. And being a bladesinger who actually casts like spelly spells every turn instead of just booming blade, which feels a lot more like just a glorified weapon attack and less like a spell to me. So in that way, I feel more like a spell sword, spell whip, with this build than maybe any other Bladesinger build that I've done to date. And yeah, the idea of just rooting an enemy in place, round after round, doing respectable damage to them consistently, while keeping them from really doing anything effective, is just such a powerful and fun concept to play with. I would love to try this build out in game sometime, and I certainly hope you feel the same and that you get to try it out. Because yeah, that's the build for the week. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed putting it together. I love you guys. You're so awesome. Thank you so much for everything that you do for me, for this channel. I could not do what I do, I could not be where I am without you, so thank you. I hope you have a really great day and a fantastic week, a fantastic uh, fortnight. <laughs> and that if you don't, I hope that you hang in there. Better days are sure to come. I hope that you be good and kind and that you stay safe and that I see you again very soon. But until then, take care. Au revoir. Getting set up. Hi. <laughs> Recording while on vacation. Hey, that's my one. Super easy and yeah. fun. <laughs> Bye. Uh -huh. You guys are leaving now, right? Yes. Okay. We? Do you hear the people sing, singing the song of angry men? It is the music of a people who will not be slaves again. When the beating of your heart echoes the beating of the drum, there is a life about to start when tomorrow comes. I've had Les Mis stuck in my head for like two weeks now. I wonder why.
Don't say that. Haste. Fire bell. <laughs> oh. That's going to be a common occurrence, I think. Oh, don't you love it when you record for 20 minutes, but you didn't actually push the record button, so you didn't record for 20 minutes, and now you got to go back and redo it all? I don't. I don't love that. Admittedly, it only bear... <clears throat> oh. Whew. It's getting hot in here. Air conditioning is a privilege, not a right. <laughs> and we don't have it where we're staying. So I got to keep the windows open. But when you're recording, you got to keep the windows closed. So it is getting hot and I am starting to glisten. <laughs> glisten might be a generous term.